and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. God himself says to Daniel, you've written this, now roll it up and seal it till the times of the end. God himself has given Daniel a command. So there's no question about who wrote this scripture. The Lord Jesus himself, if, the, if that's not enough for you though, says in Matthew 24, 15, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation <clears throat> spoken of through the prophet Daniel. Our Lord Jesus himself makes mention of Daniel and makes mention of the book of Daniel. So when you hear these liberal theologians question the scripture, and you can hear endlessly uh, in our time, be careful that you don't pay too much attention to them. Now, just as a grammatical consideration, the author writes in the first person in much of the book of Daniel. He also writes in the third person, but both of them are indications that it was Daniel who actually wrote scripture. Not only that Jesus says so, not only that we have the witness of our Lord, um, Daniel unquestionably wrote the book. <clears throat> so who was Daniel? Excuse me. His name means God is my judge. Mm -hmm. He was a young man, as you talked about, Miss Dixie, who was uprooted from his home, exiled in a far land. Babylon, because they would have had to travel from Jerusalem. If you can put that up for me, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it to you. It's okay. It was about 900 miles. And you think back to that period of history, that would have been approximately 605 BC. Going from Jerusalem down here in the southern part of Israel, all the way up north into what was Assyria, and then traveling east and south down to Babylon, about 900 miles. So big group of people like that, you figuring 10 miles a day. An army liked to make 20 miles a day back then. When Hank would do a rope march in the Marine Corps, they liked to do 20 miles during the course of the day. Uh, not many folks could do that, but they were making about 10 miles a day. So you're figuring this trip from Jerusalem to Babylon took about three months. 15 to 20 year old uh, kid. He was probably closer to 15 based on what the scholars said. A group of old, older people, uh, young people all mixed together, children. They weren't making a lot of time. Tough trip. If you've ever been out in that region, particularly the north up there um, in Assyria, but then as they come east, they're traveling through the desert. And there's not a lot of water out there. If you get far from the river, you're, you're in trouble because there is no water, period. So not a, not a happy time, not an easy time for you. Now, take just a minute and, you know, why do we even talk about this stuff? And is it important? It is important. because You, you want to understand what they were feeling as much as you can. So put yourself in their shoes just a minute. Envision being in that situation. Somebody tore you out of your home. They probably killed some of your family members in the process. And you can figure an army, they're not particularly nice to the captains. They'll be as nice as they have to be to get them to where they're going alive because they have value and because they have a command from their king. But apart from that, these are not nice guys. They're not happy people. They're not going to make your life easy. So that's what you've got, thinking a 15-year-old kid. Okay. Uprooted from his home in a harshest kind of way. Um, the temple life, they loved the temple. The temple was everything to a devout Jewish person. That was torn away from them. So imagine, if you will, adding all that together, the way they must have felt. Despair, yeah, they would have felt some of that. Um, they had felt, and we talked about this previously, God made promises. And from the perspective of some of the Hebrews, God didn't keep his promises. You depended on God, and he didn't keep his promises. Now, that's not true, but that's undoubtedly the way that they felt. They had failed in their responsibilities, not all of them, but most of them. But imagine those who had kept the law, and here they are being uprooted. That's not a happy time for them. So Daniel woke up in a place that wasn't a happy place, as did all the Hebrews. And I asked you maybe once or twice in the past, have you ever woke or waked up in a place? How did I get here? What in the world am I doing here? Has that ever happened to you? Happened to me once or twice. Sure did. 
woke up in a place I'm wondering what in the world. I actually volunteered for this. You got to be kidding me. So I'm sure it's happened to you though. I'm sure you woke up, waked up in a place that was unhappy. The question I would ask you this morning, so having done that, how did you behave when you woke, woke up? Did you remember who you belonged to? Daniel, with such an, an incredible integrity, remembered who he belonged to. And he was the one who had the courage as a 15-year-old boy to stand up and say, my God, my creator, I will honor him. I will obey him. That's what this scripture is about. This morning, we say a lot of things about this scripture, but he honored his God. So again, I'm going to ask you the question, how do you behave when you wake up in those situations? You didn't plan. Maybe it was a coincidence that you wound up there. We talked about that. Yeah. If you're a Christian, I know you know it, but I want to remind you of it this morning. If you're a Christian, there are no coincidences. God doesn't just turn you loose and let you go. What does that say up there? There you go. He's going to direct your steps. He's going to put you on the path and keep you on that path. If you belong to him, if you're maintaining your relationship the way you need to be doing. So Daniel was a righteous man. He was probably of royal blood, princely lineage from King Zedekiah's side. So add that to everything else. Here's a guy who's a prince and he's stuck in this situation. Now he lived, they, they think, they say, from approximately 620 BC to 538. So he lived a long life. He served not only Nebuchadnezzar, his son, Belshazzar, or excuse me, Belshazzar, but also King Cyrus of the Persians and the Medes. So he did it all also with integrity, that word that we talked about. Now, Daniel in the scripture in the Old Testament is considered one of the major prophets. Y'all know the major prophets and the minor prophets? Major, not because they're any better, but because of the length. They're longer, typically, than the minor prophets. <clears throat> now, I want to give you some information just so that you know, so that you can always argue intelligently. The book of Daniel was included in the Hebrew canon, the book of the Hebrew canon, and that occurred in the late first century, scholars think, long time ago. The Jewish rabbis, the Jewish fathers, they looked at the book of Daniel and it was inspired scripture from their perspective. It was adopted into the Christian canon sometime in the third century AD. Same deal. They looked at it. The weight of those rabbinical scholars carried with them. It was inspired. No one questioned that it was inspired or breathed of God. So the book of Daniel, even though you'll hear some today say, man, it doesn't even belong there, belongs in our Christian Bible. It is in the Hebrew Bible. It was in the Septuagint, which uh, was canonized or, excuse me, put together, formalized in approximately the second century BC. So it's been around a long time. It's thought to have been composed around 530 BC. Again, those liberal theologians will argue with you about that. Made up of 12 chapters, one through six, on the stories that read, we read about Daniel, the lion's den, the fiery furnace, uh, the um, interpreting of the two dreams that King Nebuchadnezzar had, all of that. And then chapters seven through 12 are visions of the future. So God takes care of his people today, we see in the book of Daniel. God also doesn't want you to be an unintelligent Christian. He's going to let you know what's coming off in the future as much as he chooses to reveal to us. Now, God has control of the present. He's in control. And he's in control of the future. The Lord, he encourages and he informs us. The scripture in today's uh, lesson is very straightforward. 
The plain meaning is very clear. You can read verses 8 through 21, and it's not hard to understand. You get into the, uh, or the subsequent chapters, and it's going to be a little bit different. Daniel resolved and proposed an alternative that was accepted. It was that simple. Uh, they are going to have us defile ourselves. I got a better way. We don't want to break our God's law. God showed himself faithful to his servants in Daniel in the first chapter. The scripture, when it says Daniel resolved, the scripture literally means Daniel set his heart. He set his heart. It indicates a careful, thoughtful decision. Now, that begs a whole lot of questions when we look at our lives. Do you make your decisions as they relate to God and your relationship to him in the same way, carefully and thoughtfully? Have you resolved in your mind how you're going to live your life? Have you resolved in your mind when you look at God's law, it's been revealed to us in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Have you looked at it? Have you determined what it says, what it means for you as much as you can? And have you determined, have you set in your heart that you're going to live in according with what it says? Have you carefully thought through your decisions in relation to Scripture, God's law? We should bathe all of this in prayer because it's not an easy thing to stand up to peer pressure. Even in our day and time, I can remember times in my past, particularly when I was young, I gave in to peer pressure. It is, I can't bear to think about it. And I know you all probably have some like experiences. Because Daniel and his friends stood up, everybody around him was blessed. Everybody. The officials who were in charge of them, Daniel, of course, and his friends, the Hebrews were blessed. The officials, King Nebuchadnezzar was blessed. The nation or the Chaldean dynasty, the nation of Babylon was blessed. All those nations around were blessed. The nation of Israel were blessed because of one man and what he did, his determination to obey God. Daniel trusted God at the risk of his life. He behaved as if God was transcendent, above, so far beyond, in mighty power. He behaved of his God as if God was in everything. He was imminent. Hank likes that word. God being in everything. God being a part of everything. He behaved as if God was sovereign. What does it mean? We've talked about it, so I know y'all got it on the tip of your tongue. What does it mean for God to talk about his sovereignty? What does that mean to you? He's in complete control of everything. There is nothing that touches our lives that is not sifted through his hands. That's a pretty good answer. I think you've been working on it. Do y'all behave as if God is sovereign in your life? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I ask it again. Do you behave as if God is sovereign in your life? Are you trusting God the same way? Does your life reflect that kind of trust? For Daniel, there was no doubt. God was first. God was foremost. God is sovereign. <clears throat> Colossians 1.16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through and for him. Do you question that God is all powerful? Do you question that he created the heaven and the earth? Do you ever question his sovereignty? Well, I would. I would. Jeremiah 32. Ah, sovereign Lord. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. The God that you serve, if you serve him this morning, nothing is too hard for him. Nothing, listen to me, listen to me. If you don't hear anything else this morning, I want to say this to you. Nothing. Stomping my foot. Nothing is too hard for God. 
You don't have a situation. We think we do, but I'm promising you right now from a life of hard experience, nothing is impossible for our God in there. Is no ditch he can't raise you up out of. He covers you with his wing. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 103, 19 says, the Lord, excuse me. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Romans 11, 34, 36. Now y'all listen to this scripture. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever. How is God's sovereignty on display in Daniel? That first 8 through 21 verses that we read. How would you say? Help me out. How is his sovereignty on display? Is God sovereign? Y'all believe that? He honored their faithfulness. He honored their faithfulness. He did. Thank you. What else? God's sovereignty. How is it on display? Even in slavery, Daniel. Yes, sir. What else? God caused the favor through the officials to say yes. God did that. They could have said, no, I'm not putting my neck out on the line for you, but God said to those officials. And extrapolating, th exactly. Thank you. And extrapolating from that, what do we know the scripture says? We've mentioned it many times. The rulers, the king's hearts are in the hands of God. Your heart this morning sitting there. God bless you. Your heart is in God's hands. Listen, you have troubles in your life. Sometimes God brings those troubles. Sometimes, and I'm speaking from experience here, because he wants you on your knees. He wants you to remember that you belong to him, that he created you, and he's got a way for you out of it. So don't you forget that. Now, God holds our hearts. Hey, Roy. Yes, sir. We we have friends in West Africa that were in the Civil Wars. I mean, they were just, the bad guys were just slaughtering people. Yes. Yeah. Well, they'd cross a border or something, and these guys would pray and pray and ask God to deliver them. And they went through some checkpoints that they could have <coughs> never gotten through. But God delivered them because they just earnestly prayed. Amen. And they were in some battles too. They got caught in battle in the middle of battles. Amen. And they had to pray to the Lord for the Lord to deliver them. And, and he, he did deliver them. So I've seen it. I mean, I've seen it in this country too, but I've seen people in battle with some bad guys and God delivered them right from the hand of, of death. Oh. Bill was sitting on a hot uh, landed zone in Vietnam, and he won't do it, but he can tell you a story about not being sure he's going to get out of there. And you ask him, if you get him aside by himself, and you ask him if he thinks God is sovereign, God delivered him, he'll say yes. He did. Where's Richard? Richard, Richard, I know, been in several fights, and it was the same thing. God delivered him right out, right out of it. I remember driving down the highway in Baghdad one day, and we're, for whatever reason, we were in, in an unarmored vehicle. That was kind of dumb. We took an unarmored vehicle that day. Well, they shot a rocket, the bad guys did, and it landed about 100 feet in front of us. Did not go off. I still have a vision of that rocket right in the middle of the, <laughs> right in the, middle of the highway. Did not go off. Thank God. And I can tell you a bunch of stories like that. Richard can tell you. Everybody sitting here, I'm sure, can tell stories. Okay. God delivers. God has got us in his hands. We are protected. Matthew Henry said, y'all remember Matthew Henry? He was a fine preacher from the 17, 1700s. He said that Daniel attained favor from his king by divine favor. God worked in the heart of that king. Every creature is that to us, Matthew Henry went on to say, which God makes it to be. God works in your life. He does these things. Yes, Ms. Don. And also... Our faith is strengthened from faith to faith. All the things, you know, it just builds your character stronger and closer. So, amen. Go through it. Keep testing sometimes. Amen. Are his people are watching how you react? That's true. Mm -hmm. Are his promises conditional? 
Well, you tell me. <laughs> Do you think they are? You didn't walk in the integrity of heart. It wasn't done. You weren't going to be delivered. Well, I think they're conditioned. I think they're based on how we view God and how we respond to God and how we conduct our lives with God. Uh, if you're out here living like the devil, chances are you're not going to be delivered every time that you think you should be. You may not even think you're supposed to be delivered, but are they conditional? Are there promises in the Word of God there? Look, you're going to see where Daniel's being promoted after he started. Okay, I got, I got it. 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 Don't go too far there. <laughs> Matthew Henry went on to say, we must see the hand of God in the events that will follow us and acknowledge him with thankfulness. Let me come back to that real quick. Are they conditional? I don't want to take that too far, but I will say this to, to what you're saying. God has given us a responsibility, just like he did the Israelites. They're in exile because they sinned. God made promises. He made a deal with them. He said, I'm going to do this. You do this in the covenant. They chose to disobey. Consequently, did they meet their end of the bargain? No. And so they suffered the consequences. Is that a principle that applies in our life? Of course it is. There's no question about it. If God has given you a command and you choose to disobey, what's going to be the result? You're going to be disciplined. It ain't going to be funny. You may get away with it for a little while, but I can tell you again from painful hard experience, you won't get away from it for long. God will punish those that he loves. So are there conditions? Yeah, sure, of course there are. Now, I've got so much and I have no time. We're out. But I want to talk about one thing this morning because as I was studying the lesson, this stuck out for me more than anything else. Now, Daniel obeyed. He obeyed God's commands at the risk of his life, as did his young friends. Now, I want to ask you this morning, do you obey? And you say, Roy, that's a ridiculous question. Of course I obey. Well, do you really? Okay. Well, let me ask you this. How is your attitude when you're in the process of obeying you ever tell a child to do something and they roll their eyes at you? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Oh, I got some response here. Not my kids. <laughs> That's funny. I've seen those rolling eyes before. Not from my son, but from some other kids. <laughs> Adam, if he was here this morning, he said, Dad, yeah, I never rolled my eyes at you. Okay. So, you rolled your eyes back at him. Maybe. Maybe, maybe you uh, roll your eyes. Well, let me tell you, don't do it. Don't roll your eyes at God. God doesn't like grumblers and complainers. So contrary to that, do you obey with eagerness? When you know you're supposed to do something and you get a word from God, maybe. Do you obey eagerly? You know, there is a thing that used to be in the Uniform Code of Military Justice for all Airmen, Marines, uh, Navy, and whatever that other one is, the Army. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> used to be in there and it said, you will obey with uh, cheerful and willing obedience. I think they took it out because that was just too hard to keep. <laughs> cheerful anyway. <laughs> There's also one that is no longer there. They took it out because it was too hard to keep. It, it talked about um, silent insolence, rolling your eyes. Mm -hmm. Let me encourage you this morning to obey God. Let me encourage you this morning that your God loves you and that you, because of what he did for you, what's the main point of any time we get together? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. He loved you so much. You need to love him back. If you're not this morning, you're missing a boat. And don't be rolling your eyes, okay? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the blessings of the day. Father, thank you for your great mercy. Lord, I pray, we pray as a people to you, our God, and we ask, please have mercy on us and please cover us with your wings. And we thank you, Father, because we know that you do. Father, I ask you that you will bless this people that you will bless their families, that you will bless them as they go, that you'll keep them safe and that you'll bring them back safely. Please watch over them, let no harm come to them. And Lord, thank you for all that you do, Lord, but mostly thank you 
for the hope of our salvation. Yes. And we ask all these things in the great and the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Y'all come back next week. <laughs>